We all know that, well, we all know of families that have been destroyed by some indiscretion. Our own family may be in a terrible mess because of something we did or something one of the other members did. And the thing is, the anger and hate generated by the hurt just keeps bubbling along. And we cannot break through the pain barrier. There are many cases of bitterness and hatred that we can point to, but, but the one I came across is pretty depressing. It is about a man who died and here is what they read in his will when he died. And this is true. It says, Unto my daughters, Mary and Victoria, by reason of their bad attitude toward a, do a doting uh, father, I leave the sum of one dollar to each and a father's curse. May their lives be fraught with misery and happiness and poignant sorrow. May their death be soon and of a lingering, malignant, and torturous nature. Wow. How sad. When bitterness and hatred become the driving forces in people's lives. How sad. When serenity, reason, love and compassion are replaced by bitterness and hatred. It is no, no, no wonder that, that uh, God instructed Paul in, in the book of Ephesians to write, uh, Ephesians 4.31, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And the reason I'm talking, uh, for which I'm talking about hatred, bitterness, jealousy, and envy is because these were the feelings that the brothers had toward Joseph. I mean, it's bad enough to be hated by strangers, but to be hated by the ones you love? For whom you mean good and who are family? That must have been very, very difficult for Joseph to cope with. But let me put this in context here. Uh, everything started in Jacob's family. If you remember, I mean, the, this story is, begins in chapter 37. And if you remember, uh, Rachel and Leah, uh, had a rivalry of their own and they had this rivalry of having kids even their maids were involved and it was them versus us and of course if you live in a family like that you know children do and say that which the parents say and do you know, sometimes we, uh, as, as, as adults, are more concerned about telling kids what not to do rather than making sure of us not doing what we tell kids not to do. And very subtly, that which we do or don't do influences our kids. So it was in Jacob's family that this started. Jacob favored Joseph. Uh, Jacob also being called Israel. He loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he told them he loved them. You know how on the wise of Jacob's part to do that and to actually make that known. I mean, that's, that's horrible. Uh, my my father's big picture uh, in, in life is this. Uh, life is too short and death is too permanent. So he said, well, you know, personal feuds will end 
in the grave. So why not end them now? Why not end them now? I mean, not a bad big picture view, right? But God's intention over it, over it all is an even better big picture view. You know, as far as Joseph was concerned, the pain his brother caused was huge. But Joseph forgave them for what they had done to him. For his sense of God's providence enables him to see a pattern in the events of his life. He says that the negative events of life were used by God to make something good. You see, the thing is, it is true. God is like this genius sculptor who can make art out of anything. Give him a tire, a racket, a bicycle, and some old type of work, and he will weld it and make it into an eagle. Nothing is too bent to be used by God. Not even tragedies, not even bad decisions, not even plain human meanness. And Joseph tells his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And this is a human predicament, of course. The human situation looks very bleak today, these days. Because we do terrible things to each other, even in our families. Our fear and our greed make monsters of us. Nations that are not at war with other nations are at war within themselves. And I can relate to that. And honestly, look at what's going on in our nation today. Well, let me give you another example. I lived, I lived through dictatorship for 21 years. Where families were literally divided because of political views and kill each other for, for that. Many Americans responded to what happened in Charlottesville with disbelieving horror, you know. How could this happen? How could this happen in America, 2017? This is not who we are, and yet, this is who we are. With the last presidential election, many have concluded that America was divided. But more than that, America was revealed for who we truly are. And the thing is, people learn to be whatever their society and culture teaches them. We often assume that it takes parents actively teaching their kids for them to be racist. The truth is that unless parents actively teach kids not to be racist, they will be. Most if not all people, all of us, carry implicit biases and unexamined prejudices. And some may harbor feelings of fear or resentment that they don't express in public. But when people come into contact with an organized ideology that valorizes or glorifies an, in, uh, a, an intergroup struggle like a race struggle, that scaffolds from people's everyday prejudices into something, into something, <clears throat> excuse me, altogether more violent. You know, that's the torch bearing white supremacists shouting racist and anti Semitic slogans. 
and protesters and counter protesters colliding with violence and chaos. And then a car driven by a known Nazi sympathizer mowing down a crowd of activists. Someone has said, well, well it's simply not true that we just need to wait for the old, for few old racist people left in the South to die off and then we'll be fine. The thing is, and the tragedy is that the people who marched in Charlottesville were young people. And the thing is, the environment of, for racism is still here. How then should we regard our, our culture of race and racism and respond to it as believers whose primary source, scriptures, offers a radically different vision for humanity? It is true. I am what I do, in part. I am where I come from, in part. I am what others see and expect of me, in part. I am part of all of that, and all of that is part of me. It is true for me, it is true for you. But the good news is that there is more to it, and therefore more to you and to me than that. I am more than that. I am somebody of worth because I am made in the image of God who makes nothing bad. If we look deep inside of us, we're no more different than, than, than Joseph's family. <clears throat> A friend of mine once commented that a person who has done you wrong will never forgive you. This type of attitude is called guilt transference. And we have all had a, a dose of it at some time or other. And going back to the story, we see that Joseph does seem to rub it in, rub it in a little bit, you know, with his, you saw me, you saw me into Egypt. But he also plays in, on their fears and exploits his imperial power over them. His actions may not constitute intentional revenge, but they certainly are not worthy of a Hallmark car either. However, what he does makes help, helps them to serve, to make his brothers face their past actions. And so we come to the issue of reconciliation. There cannot be reconciliation unless we face the wrong we have done, admit it, and turn from it. In fact, there cannot be forgiveness without repentance. And in Christian circles, we often demand a condition of forgiveness, but there is no such thing. Even God does not forgive without repentance. Forgiveness, the putting away of past hurts, is not a myth an easy thing to do because the path the pathway to forgiveness lies in recognizing God's forgiveness of our sins a forgiveness that covers past present and future sins it is when we see the mercy that has flowed to us from the cross that we are able to apply a bit of mercy ourselves Perfect forgiveness probably is beyond us, but we can make a reasonable fist of it. The reason Joseph was able to forgive is because he concluded in the end. And he may have said, you know, I became aware that my life was more than the sum of, of my little fears, my little hates, and my little loves. 
My life is larger than I imagined, and I decide to embrace the largeness that is God's gift for my life. Let me finish with a story. An office reports that, the, that they have an answering machine that instruct, uh, uh, instructed callers to leave their name and address and to spell any difficult words. And early one Monday, when an assistant was reviewing weekend messages, she heard an enthusiastic woman recite her name and address, and then confidently say, my difficult word is Reconciliation. R E C O N C I L I A T I O N. Yeah. <clears throat> Everyone is a comic, and I love that. But indeed, reconciliation is a, is a difficult word. It's not difficult to spell but difficult to carry out. But also it's an important word, especially for our days, for our lives. I remember when, when my daughter was um, 11 years old, 10 or 11, she came from school in tears one day. And a couple of older kids had bullied her the bus stop. And we soon learned the tension had been you know, brewing for, for some time. And for several days, there had been taunts, and then you know, the, the, the pushing and the shoving, and the conflict escalated. And Carries wanted to stay at home from school. She, so she wouldn't have to confront the, uh, the girls and there was a boy in the next days. And we called, Shirley and I called the school and found great support. And they said, well, we, we'll be happy to call the girls' parents, uh, they told us. And they, and they also, and they said, and you should call the police. And, and Shirley said, well, we, we, we don't know what we will do yet. And, and I felt that calling the police was a resort to be used when everything went, you know, else failed. But I wanted to consider first other ways of handling the situation. So I told them not to call the police. I will call, we will call the parents. <coughs> and, uh, I remember uh, one day we we took our our, our to school and, and we didn't use the bus that day and so she looked through through the window and and, and said in alarm, oh those are the girls who beat me up. And they were standing in front of almost in front of the car. So I stepped outside, and I immediately think, uh, thought of what I wanted to say to them. But surely, a natural peacemaker, acted first. And she opened the door of the car and said with, uh, with a smile, and, and, and this was uh, at the very beginning, hey girls. And I remember in, in the schools in Chile, there are stands right outside the school that sell everything, you know, everything. Ice cream, candy, and uh, it's still out. Uh, every, everything. And she said, hi girls, would you, would you like some ice cream? And it was, it was warm. And they looked at each other in puzzlement, but they, you know, they were nine, 11 years old. After all, they shrugged their shoulders, they, yep, yep. Uh, why not? Sure. <clears throat> and I remember that Shirley introduced me to them and also Carrie's. And at that time we had a little cat that Carrie was carrying. 
And, and Shirley said, well, but I, and by the way, you know this is Carrie's, our daughter. <coughs> Her idea was to help the girls uh, see that she was a person, not a target. That she had a family, that she lived in a neighborhood and owned a family pet. So we had some conversation with the ice cream while we, we ate ice cream and after a few minutes uh, Shirley said, I know that there's been some trouble at, at the bus stop. I think there may be a misunderstanding. And they noted that there had indeed been trouble at the bus stop. And Shirley continued. Maybe we can talk about the misunderstanding so you can be friends. They nodded their agreement and we talked until the ice cream was finished, which was you know, a few minutes. And eventually the, the girls apologized and said that there will be no more trouble. And there wasn't ever. When the principal called, oh, well, did you resolve the problem? Uh, we said, uh, yeah, we've taken care of it. And what did you do? Uh, he wondered. And Shirley said, well, we fed them ice cream. <laughs> you know, reconciliation indeed is a difficult, difficult word. A difficult task. But what could be more important? It may be easier to control conflict by force than to persevere and find a way through to harmony and cooperation. Force can stabilize a situation. It can impose a truce. But reconciliation, true reconciliation, leads to peace, which is a far better outcome. Joseph found peace. After all these years that he suffered, he wept. That he felt his hatred for what was going on and the hatred of his brothers. But found peace because he was able to reconcile. First of all, he was able to forgive and to make peace with himself. Blessed are the reconcilers. May they all be given ice cream they can never eat, right? <laughs>